Good morning, I'm Sarah, survivor, author, speaker, and clarity coach. I help women learn how to get safe, stable, and strong after experiencing betrayal, trauma, or abuse. Today, I'm inviting you to join my Jesus bubble. This is where I spend time with God, and right now, I've been reading the book Hind's Feet on High Places. Our hero in the book is named Much Afraid, and she has been journeying away from the Valley of Humiliation and her family of fearing members to the high places, where she has been promised that she will experience true and total love, and that she will no longer be lame and crippled and all twisted in her ability to walk and move. She will be healed. So we are right after she has laid all of her longings for human love on the altar. And this section, today is short, but it's called Healing Streams. When at last, much afraid awoke, the sun was high in the sky, and she looked out through the mouth of the cave in which she found herself lying. Everything was shimmering in a blaze of radiant sunshine which burnished every object with glory. She lay still a little longer, collecting her thoughts and trying to understand where she was. The rocky cave into which the sunbeams were pouring was warm and quiet and drenched with the sweet perfume of spikenard, frankincense, and myrrh. This perfume, she gradually realized, was emanating from the wrappings which covered her. She gently pushed back the folds, sat up, and looked about her. Then the memory of all that had happened came to her. She and her two companions had come to a cloud-filled canyon high up on the mountains and to an altar of sacrifice, and the priest had wrenched out of her heart her flower of human love and burned it on the altar. On remembering that, she glanced down at her chest and saw it was covered with a cloth soaked in the spices whose perfume stole out and filled the cave with sweetness. She pushed the cloth aside a little curiously and was astonished to find no trace of a wound, not even a scar, nor was there any hint of pain or aching or stiffness anywhere in her body. Rising quietly, she went outside and then stood still and looked about her. The canyon, which had been so shrouded in mist that nothing had been distinguishable, now shimmered in the golden sunlight. Soft, verdant grass grew everywhere, starred with gentians and other little jewel-like flowers of every variety. There were banks of sweet-smelling thyme, moss, and myrtle along the rocky walls, and everything sparkled with dew. In the center of the canyon, at a little distance from the cave, was the long stone altar, but in the sunlight, she saw that the flowers and mosses grew all about it and clothed its sides with verdure. Excuse me. Little birds hopped about here and there, scattering the dewdrops off the glass of the grasses and chirping merrily as they preened their plumage. One was perched on the altar itself, its little throat throbbing as it trilled forth a song of joy. But the most beautiful and wonderful thing of all was that out from under the rock, there gushed a great river of water, clear as crystal. It then flowed in a series of cascades and threw rock pools right through the canyon till it came to a broad lip of rock, over which it poured with a noise of shouting and tumultuous gladness. She was at the very source of the great fall and knew now that it flowed from under the altar to which the priest had laid her. For some time, she stood looking about her, her heart leaping and thrilling Excuse me, with a growing joy, which was beyond her understanding and a peace indescribably sweet, which seemed to enfold her. She was quite alone in the canyon. There were no signs of her companions, sorrow and suffering, nor of the priest of the altar. The only things which breathed and moved in the canyon beside herself were the cheerful little chirping birds and the insects and butterflies flittering among the flowers. High overhead was a cloudless sky against which the peaks of the high places shone dazzlingly white. The first thing she did after she had taken in her surroundings was to step toward the river which gushed out from under the altar. It drew her irresistibly. 
she stooped down when she got to the bank and dabbled her fingers in the crystal water. It was icy cold, but it sent a shock of ecstasy tingling through her body. And without further delay, she put off the white linen robe she was wearing and stepped into one of the rocky pools. Never she had, had she experienced anything so delicious and exhilarating. It was like immersing herself in a stream of bubbling life. When at last she again stepped out of the pool, she was immediately dry and tinging, tingling from head to foot with a sense of perfect well-being. As she stood on the mossy bank by the pool, she happened to glance down and noticed for the first time that her feet were no longer the crooked, ugly things which they always had been, but were straight feet, perfectly formed, shining white against the soft green grass. And then she remembered the healing stream of which the shepherd had spoken, which gushed out of the ground in the high places. Stepping straight back into the pool with a shock of sweetest pleasure and putting her head beneath the clear waters, she splashed them about her face. Then she found a little pool among the rocks, still and clear as a mirror. Kneeling down, she looked into its unruffled surface and saw her face quite clearly. It was true. The ugly, twisted mouth had vanished and the face she saw reflected back by the water was as relaxed and perfect as the face of a little child. After that, she began to wander about the canyon and noticed wild strawberries and blueberries and other small berries growing on the banks. She found a handful of these as refreshing and sustaining a meal as she had ever eaten. Then she came to the lip of the rock cliff over which the river cast itself and stood a long time watching the water as it leaped over the edge. With the noise of its tumultuous joy drowning every other sound, she saw how the sun glorified the crystal waters as they went swirling downward, and far below she saw the green alps where the shepherd had led her, and where they had stood at the foot of the same fall. She felt completely encompassed by peace and a great inner quietness and contentment drowned every feeling of curiosity and loneliness and anticipation. She did not think about the future at all. It was enough to be there in that quiet canyon, hidden away high up in the mountains with the river of life flowing beside her and to rest and recover herself after the long journey. After a little, she lay down on a mossy bank and slept and when she woke again, bathed herself in the river again. So the long, quiet day passed, like a sweet dream, while she rested and bathed and refreshed herself at intervals with the berries and then slept again. When at last the shadows lengthened, and the sun sank in the west, and the snow peaks glowed glorious in rose and flame, she went back into the cave, laid herself down among the spice-perfumed coverings, and slept as deeply and dreamlessly as she had the first night when the priest laid her there to rest. And that's the end of our reading for today. Tomorrow we'll read about Hind's feet, where she learns to leap. Thank you for joining me this morning. I know this one was short, but it's really quite beautiful. And we don't want to rush through the story of the part where she is experiencing the healing and the transformation, right? If you've been stumbling through this for yourself and seeking healing and transformation, I'd love to walk with you on that journey. I'll drop a link underneath to show you where you can work with me once a month and how you can figure out ways to take the next best steps forward for you for your situation. Until tomorrow, have a good day.